take your Bibles this morning, and I'd like you to turn to the book of 1 John. I want you to turn to 1 John, and we're going to look at chapter number 5 uh, this morning. Uh, how many believe that we can have victory in Christ? Amen. You know, I really get sick of what I call the bunker mentality within Christian circles. And the bunker mentality basically manifests itself in two ways. One, we are waving the white flag of surrender and defeat. And the other way that it manifests itself is that we are just biding time for the Lord's return. Now, I don't know about you, but nowhere in Scripture are we ever told that we are to wave the white flag in surrender and defeat. And so we give up our standards and we give up our children and we give up our marriages and we give up our churches and we give up everything that we've stood for for years. Well, because it's getting too hard and the world's just wicked anyway and the world's going to take it all uh, nonetheless. Uh, I don't have that mentality. I don't have that mentality because the Bible doesn't allow me to have that mentality. The Bible tells me that you and I can have victory. That you and I can have prosperity. And I'm not talking only about monetary. Amen. That you and I can have success. And we don't have to wave the white flag of surrender and defeat. The other one is, is that we lock ourselves up and we basically say, well, we're going to bide our time until the Lord comes back. Listen, there is nothing that Christ told us to do to hide in a bunker until He comes back. There's nothing in Scripture that indicates that. In fact, what he does tell people is to occupy till I come. Look, when you occupy a place, that means you've had victory. Amen? After World War II, we occupied Japan. Why? Because we won and we had the victory. See, when you occupy a place, it means that you have the victory. And so we have the victory here. And we don't wave the white flag of surrender and defeat. And we don't lock ourselves in a bunker and say, well, I just hope the Lord comes back real soon. Look, I hope the Lord come back, comes back real soon too. But I'm not going to sit around and just simply wait for it to happen. Yeah. Amen? I'm going to work and I'm going to plan and I'm going to labor and I'm going to fight as though God has already given us the victory because He has. And what I want to talk to you this morning about is having victory through the power of faith. Are you with me this morning? Having victory through the power of faith. And I want to start off by looking at 1 John chapter number 5, and I want you to look with me this morning at verse number 4. 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 4. Look at what it says. He says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Are you born of God this morning? Amen. Are you born of God this morning? Amen. Then the Bible says that you have overcome the world. That the world doesn't have victory over you unless you let it. And let me tell you, there's a lot of Christians who don't understand this this morning, and so they are letting the world overcome them, and they're waving the white flag of surrender and defeat, saying, I can't do it anymore. Or they're locking themselves up in a bunker, saying, well, I, just, I guess we'll just wait here until the Lord returns. Look, I don't think the Lord's return is that far away, really, honestly. But you know what? 200 years ago, preachers didn't think that the Lord's uh, return was that far away either. What I'm trying to say to you is that, look, as much as it looks like the Lord's return could happen in the next 10 or 20 years or even less, it could be 100 years from now. Listen, there's a lot of things that need to fall into place that haven't yet fallen into place. There's a lot of things that have fallen into place. There's still a lot of things. Well, you say, well, what about the, the generation of Israel and this generation shall not pass away? Look, Israel could be dispersed once again and be brought back together later on. I'm not saying that's the way it is. I'm just saying that's a possibility, right? And the regathering of Israel could happen 100 years from now after they've been dispersed by their enemies around them. Now, I'm not saying that I think that. I'm just saying it's possible. 
And so when we look at that, certainly it looks as though Christ's return is very near, but that doesn't mean it has to be that way. And so don't lock yourself up in a bunker because you may be there for a long time. The Bible says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And look at the last part of that verse. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You want to know how you have victory over the world this morning? You have victory over the world by your faith. I want you to notice this morning that he did not say that you can overcome the world and have victory over the world by your strength. He didn't say that you can have victory and overcome the world by your intellect. He didn't even say that you could overcome the world and have victory through your spirituality. Amen. Your Bible knowledge, your Bible reading. How much you pray, your prayer life. Could he not have said any one of those things? He could have said anything he wanted to. But through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, you're going to have victory and you can overcome the world through one thing, and that thing is your faith. Amen. Now let me tell you something. It doesn't take a lot of faith to get a whole lot of stuff done. Amen? Amen. I mean, let's face it, there's always part of us that doubts, right, that has no faith. Isn't that true? Don't we see that in the man in the Gospels when he comes to the Lord Jesus? Lord, help, my belie- uh, help thou mine unbelief. He says, Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. There's always a part of us that doesn't believe, right? Well, good thing God set up the system where it only takes a grain of mustard seed. Amen? That amount of faith, he says, can move mountains. He can get a whole lot of done with a little bit of faith. Praise the Lord. Because there's times when all I have is just a little bit of faith. Right? When that's all that I have. But he says here in this verse, you overcome the world and your victory comes through your faith. And you think, how in the world does that work? Well, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to see exactly how that works this morning and what that looks like. Hebrews chapter 11 Hebrews chapter 11 is a very interesting passage of Scripture. In fact, at some point in your life, I would surmise that you'd probably have the whole chapter underlined and highlighted. There's so much in chapter number 11. In fact, many people have called it the Hall of Faith because there are names listed in here that belong in the Hall of Fame when it comes to to faith, but I'll tell you, you know, this chapter number 11 of Hebrews should be right up there with Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. This chapter should also be right up there with 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Many call it the chapter of love. Revelation 19, when the Lord comes back for the final judgment. These are all marked passages and chapters in the Bible, and I think Hebrews chapter 13 is right up with there with them all. And I want to point out some things that are significant about Hebrews chapter number 11 this morning. Let's read just a little bit into this chapter. He says in verse number 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good rapport. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. How does that happen? Things that are seen don't appear? We'll explain that in a moment. Look at what it says in verse 4. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and it, uh, by it being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch. Look at verse number 7. By faith Noah. Look at verse number 8. By faith Abraham. And he goes on to talk about Moses and Isaac in verse number 20 and Joseph in verse number 22 and Rahab in verse number 31. And the list goes on and on and on. And what do we see in this chapter? We see many things. I want you to write a couple things down here. 
Before we get too much into this, I want you to write this down. First of all, we see the definition of faith. Amen? Amen. Hey, I don't know about you, but if God says, you're going to have victory through one thing, and that one thing is faith, I'd like to know, what is faith? And God says, well, here it is in verse number 1. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good rapport. First of all, he says that faith is what? Substance. Amen? Amen. Substance. It's the substance of our discussion. It's the substance of the things that we are hoping for. What are you hoping for this morning? I'll tell you one thing that I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, I will shed this body and be eternally translated into His presence. Amen. That's what I hope for. Amen. You know what else I hope for? I hope that when that happens, I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And you know what I hope for when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ? I'm not hoping that He will declare me saved, because guess what? That's already happened. My sins are already gone. Amen? Washed away by the blood of the Lamb. You know what I hope for when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which is not about salvation? Well, I'll tell you what, I will be very concerned if all of a sudden when my body sheds and I stand before the Lord and above it says great white throne of judgment, I'll be a little nervous. Because the great white throne of judgment is a place where people are declared unrighteous and cast into hell according to Revelation. The judgment seat of Christ is completely different. The judgment seat of Christ is about rewards. Amen. Amen. You know what? It's not even about loss because I don't believe God wants us to suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't think God is saying, well, I got all these rewards and you know, the, the, the less amount that I give out, the more I get to keep for myself. I don't think when we get to the judgment seat of Christ that God, Christ, is just waiting to withhold rewards from us. I think He wants to give us those rewards. I think he's looking for any reason to give us the rewards. Amen. And you know what I hope for? I hope that when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Christ looks at me and says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. I hope to hear those words. Amen? Amen. And I hope to get rewards. And you know what else I hope for? You say, Well, that's selfish. It's not selfish. Because you know what those rewards are? Those rewards are gold and silver and precious stones and all the things that survive the fire. Right? He says all of our work in the flesh is going to be burnt up, wood, hay, and stubble. But the things that we did for the Lord will remain. And that will be gold, silver, and precious stones, all the things that survived the fire. And you know what I believe those things will be made up into? I think that the, that gold and that silver and those precious stones, I think that those will be made into the crowns of righteousness that we receive. The crowns that were promised in Scripture. Amen. And you know what we see the elders doing at the presence of God in heaven after millennial, the Bible says they cast those crowns before the feet of Jesus. Boy, I'll tell you what, I sure would like to have some rewards. I sure would like to have some crowns. I sure would like to have some gold and silver and precious stones, not because I want it, but because I want something to present to my Savior when I go into His presence and I get the opportunity to cast my rewards at His feet and give Him all the praise, glory, and honor. I want that. Amen? Amen? That's what I hope. It's the substance of things hoped for. You say, Pastor Brandon, why do you do what you do? Why do you sacrifice what you've sacrificed? Because of the faith that I have, and it's the substance of the things that I'm hoping for. Amen? Amen. Look, if I wasn't hoping for those things, I would go get a real job. 
I would go get a real job where when I tell people to do something, they have to do it or they'll get fired. Because that's a whole lot easier. Amen? That's a whole lot easier than leading a volunteer army. And I'll tell you something. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. But look at what else it says. It says the evidence of things not seen. Evidence is not proof. Anyone looking for proof that God exists is not at the place of faith. Amen? You can debate an atheist. You can debate an agnostic. You can do all of those things. But look, even if you gave him all the proof in the world, it would not bring him to the place of faith. Amen. Proof does not equal faith. Amen. Evidence equals faith. Amen? Amen? Evidence equals faith. And what does it say in this passage? It says, for the evidence of things not Seen. You say, what's the difference between evidence and proof? Well, evidence connects to, but evidence rarely is the proof that something happened, like evidence in a courtroom, right? The evidence in a courtroom connects to the conclusion. It doesn't prove the conclusion. You with me? Yeah. Everything that we have in our faith, it's the substance of things that we are hoping will happen. That we know by Scripture will happen, but we're still hoping. Amen? But it's also the evidence of things not seen. Amen? Do you know why I think it's important that you're in church? I think it's important that you're in church because the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. But you know what? It goes deeper than that. That's a very surface understanding of it. You know why I think it's important that you're in church? Because you are evidence of what you believe. Amen? And when somebody comes visiting to our church, and you know what? If there were two people sitting in the pews, you know what would happen? Not a lot of evidence, is there? Every time you show up to a service, every time you show up to a fellowship, every time you do anything, anytime you pray, anytime you read your Bible, anytime you bring your Bible to work, anytime you pray before you eat in a restaurant, you know what you are? You are exhibit A. You are evidence that your faith connects to something real. Amen? That's why I think it's important. I think it's important to people visiting our church to see a good group of people here. Why? Because they need a lot of evidence to show that this faith connects to something very real. I also want you to see this. Not only is it the definition of faith, but in Hebrews chapter number 11, we also see something interesting that we don't see in a lot of other passages, and that's progressive revelation. Now, there's only one of uh, several times that this happens in Scripture, but in this chapter, we see that progressive revelation appear. And what, what is progressive revelation? Well, let me explain it this way. It's when latter Scripture illuminates previous scripture, meaning that you learn something about previous scripture that you didn't know. Here it's simply the uh, example of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 8, where we learn the names of Moses, or, uh, Egypt, uh, uh, Pharaoh's prophets in the Old Testament. You know that the names of those two prophets are never shown in the Old Testament? And then all of a sudden we come to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 8, and what happens? Well, we see uh, Janus and Jambres appear. Amen? Well, we don't see their names in the Old Testament ever. What is that? That's progressive revelation. It means that the New Testament has illuminated the Old Testament. The New Testament has given us more information than the Old Testament has given us. That is progressive revelation, and we see that happen in Hebrews chapter 11. But it's not only that. Hebrews chapter 11 is also very significant because we see the forgiveness of God. I'm trying to give you some reasons here this morning why Hebrews chapter 11 is such a great chapter. Number one, because it defines our faith. Number two, it gives us progressive revelation. Number three, 
It shows us the forgiveness of God. You say, where in the world is the forgiveness of God in Hebrews 11? Where is the forgiveness not in Hebrews chapter 11? Look, as far as I can see, didn't Moses murder somebody? As far as I can see, didn't Abraham forsake what God had given to him? Ran to Egypt? Lied about his wife? Didn't Abraham forsake what God had promised to him and take a concubine and have a child with her? Don't we see David in this passage of Scripture? All of a sudden, David, what happens with him? Well, he goes and has an affair with Bathsheba, right? But you know what's interesting? We don't ever see that in the New Testament. You know what we hear about David? He was a man after God's own heart. You know what we hear about Abraham? He's the father of the faithful. You know what we hear about Moses? He's the meekest man. Right? Look, what I'm trying to say to you is that when you get forgiveness by, from God, he is not keeping a record of all of your past failures. He's not keeping a record of your past sins. The Bible says he puts them as far as the east is from the west. He puts them in the deepest part of the ocean. Amen? The Bible says he remembers your sin no more. So don't let the devil keep reminding you about what you've done. Get it under the blood of Christ. Confess it. Forsake it. And God will forget it. Amen? That's a promise that we have in Scripture. You don't see in the New Testament God continually bringing up Abraham's failures. In fact, they're never mentioned. You don't see David's failures continually mentioned. They're not mentioned. You don't see Moses' failures mentioned. They're gone as if they never existed by the time the New Testament rolls around. Praise the Lord. That's the record you and I have. Now here's the last one, and this is the one that we're going to talk about. Not only is Hebrews chapter 11 significant because it defines our faith, it gives us progressive revelation, it shows us the depth of God's forgiveness, but it also shows us how you and I can have victory through faith. Isn't that what we learned in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 4? It said, you will overcome the world, you will have victory by one thing, your faith. And this is a great chapter to look at because all through it we see one thing. People having victory by faith. You with me? Yes. People having victory by faith. I want you to notice this this morning. The first place that we see people having victory through their faith in Hebrews chapter 11 is found in verses 4, 5, and 6. Look there with me. It says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Look at verse 6. By, but without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Let me ask you something. The first area in having victory through faith is pleasing God. I don't know about you, but I want to have victory when it comes to pleasing God. Amen. Do you want to have victory? Yes. I want to have victory when it comes to pleasing God. I want to know that what I do and the things that I do and the decisions that I make in my life put a smile on God's face. You know what religion teaches? Religion teaches you that God is always angry. And that what you do and the things that you perform and your actions and your behavior, they are just enough to keep God from zapping you with lightning. <laughs> 
And you'll find that when religion gets involved, there is no talk about pleasing God. But you know what you'll find? In Scripture, something completely different. That the Bible teaches us that you and I can please God. And you know what Hebrews chapter 11 teaches us? It teaches us that we can please God and we can have victory pleasing God through one thing, and that's through faith. Right? What does it say about the sacrifice that was given? Look at verse number 4. It says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Have you ever thought about that? Why did Abel offer a blood sacrifice and Cain offer up vegetables? You know why? Faith. That's what it was. The faith that Abel had. You say, faith in what? Look, all they knew was blood sacrifice. Do you know that? You know what? I believe that Cain and Abel from small children had heard the story of their parents. Well, remember when we were in the garden? Yeah. Remember when we used to walk and talk with God? Yeah. Remember when we sinned? Yeah. Remember that day? Remember what we did? Yeah, we sowed fig leaves together. We sowed vegetation together. A picture of man's work trying to cover their own sin. But remember when God got involved? He killed an animal and blood was shed and he clothed us with skins. What does it mean? It means that for some reason God is pleased when blood is shed and our sins are covered with what he gives us. And by faith, I believe Abel knew that story. And he said, you know what? I could give him vegetables, but boy, you know, if I took one of my livestock and, and I'm just going to have faith that that's the way God wanted it. And you know what? What happened? His faith gave him victory in pleasing God. Was God pleased with Cain's sacrifice? No. God was pleased with with Abel's sacrifice, because Abel had the faith to believe God and to follow God's example. What does it say about Enoch? Enoch was translated, right? That he might not see death. You know why? One reason, he pleased God. In a wicked world that Enoch lived in, and I could give you a whole sermon as to the world that Enoch lived in, guess what? He still, by faith, was able to please God. I don't care how wicked this world is, you can still have victory pleasing God. I don't care what you struggle with. I don't care what this world throws at you. I don't care how horrible things get in this world. Amen. By faith, if you want to please God, Faith will give you the victory. Right? It's faith. Faith in pleasing God. Just say, hey, I want to please God. How do we know that? Because it says, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. So if you want to please God this morning, there's one way to do it. Faith. Faith will give you the victory to please God. Now we have to move on. But I want you to look at this. How about victory in times of trials? Amen? Amen? In times of trials, we have the victory through faith. Where do we see that? Look at verse number 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by what? Faith. Times of trials, how about this? When times of trial are unfamiliar. What does it say in verse number 7? It says, by faith Noah being warned of God, the things not seen as yet. I've told you this before. God said, Noah, I want you to build an ark. Noah said, okay, what's an ark? 
Well, it's something that'll float when it rains. All right, Noah says, okay, what's rain? Amen. Well, rain's what's going to happen before the flood. And Noah goes, uh, okay, what's a flood? You know why? Because the Bible says it had not rained to that point. Amen. And Noah didn't know what an ark was. And Noah didn't know what a flood was. And so it says in verse number 7, it says, By faith Noah being warned of God, the things not seen as yet. But you know what? Noah said, okay, uh, you think water's going to fall from the sky? And you think there's going to be so much of it that it's going to shroud the earth in a layer of water? And you think there's going to be that much of it that we need an ark to float on? Okay, God, by faith. Noah had victory through the times of trial. Amen? Amen? Even though the trial was unfamiliar. You ever, God ever ask you to do anything that's unfamiliar to you? Well, God, I don't know how to do that. By faith, you can have the victory. God, I, I, I've never done that before. By faith, you can have the victory. Look, there's a lot of things I've never done before that God's asked me to do. Amen? Amen. You step out and you say, God, I'm going to serve you. God, I'm going to please you. God, I want to do what you want me to do. I need faith to do that. God's going to test you to see if you'll have faith when things are unfamiliar. Look, how easy would it be if God asked us to do things? We're all experts in what God asked us to do. God says, well, I'm going to ask you to do some things that are aligned with your skill set, no doubt, but I'm also going to ask you to do things that you just have no clue what to do next. But there's Noah, pounding away. Amen? Amen. Building that ark. Think of the opposition he got. Noah, what are you doing? I'm building an ark. What's an ark? This thing I'm building. Why are you doing that? Well, God said it's going to rain. What's rain, Noah? Noah? Well, it's what happens before the earth is going to be covered with a flood. Well, what's a flood? Well, it's a bunch of water that's going to cover the earth. Well, uh, well you're crazy, Noah. Right? God's going to ask you to do some things that you have never seen of, that you have never heard of before. Amen? Amen. You with me still? Yeah. I want you to think about this for a minute. How long did Noah build the ark for? Okay. Think about that. Day after day, Noah marches out to the construction site, pounds nails in, cuts some boards, pounds more nails in, goes back home, goes to sleep, wakes up the next morning, back to the construction site, pounds nails, saw some boards, go back home, go to sleep, come back to the construction site, pounds more... He does that for over a hundred years. Do you think that in a hundred years there was ever a time in Noah's life where he said, God, are you sure it's going to rain? Do you ever think there were times in his life when he said, God, I'm, I'm kind of getting sick of this monotony. Right? And God, are you sure this is what you called me to do? I'm just doing the same thing every day. I feel like my tires are spinning. That's what we would say today, right? I feel like I'm just in a rut. All right? God says, Noah, by faith, I told you to do that. By faith, I know it's unfamiliar, but if you want to have success and you want to have victory in times of trial, Noah, you've got to keep going. When you hear the name Noah, what pops into your mind? I don't know about you, but you know what pops into my mind? 40 days and 40 nights. But did you know 99% of his ministry was every day going down to the construction site, pounding boards, sawing nails, back to the house, going back to the construction site, sawing boards, pounding nails, back home, back to the construction site, back home, back to the construction site, for a hundred years. And you know what? All we know mostly about Noah is 40 days and 40 nights out of that over 120 years. Amen. You know what it means? 
It means sometimes when God calls you to do something, it's just going to be monotonous. And the whole purpose for your life may boil down to 40 days and 40 nights, or it may boil down to 40 seconds, or it may boil down to 40 minutes. Amen? Amen. It's going to be amazing when we get to heaven and God shows us the purpose that he had in our lives. Because we, our purpose may be something really, really simple. Right? I know we want some grand purpose for our lives, right? But how about the man who was blind at the side of the road and the disciples said, hey, why is this man blind? Did he sin or his parents sin? And what does Christ say? Neither. He's blind that God may be glorified. Amen. What if that's your lot in life? is to be sick so that God could get the glory. How about Fanny Crosby? Blind. No fault of her own. The surgeons messed up her eyes when she was a kid. Right? You know what? That was her lot in life. I know we'd like to have some big ministry or we'd like to be famous or we'd like everybody to pat us on the back and say, oh, they did a good job. We want something glorious. But what if your purpose was to be blind for your life so that you could bring God glory? Noah said, all right, God, I'm going to do the unfamiliar day in and day out because faith is going to give me victory through this trial. Not only that, but look at verse number 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. Did Abraham really obey? Well, there's a whole story behind that. He eventually obeyed. <laughs> At first he didn't obey. But you know what God remembers? That he obeyed. I'm sure glad there's a whole lot of times when I didn't obey. And when I get to heaven, God's going to go, thanks for being so obedient. Be like, me? me? Really? <laughs> but you know what? Abraham's time of trial was unknown to him. Amen? It says in verse number 9, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob with the heirs of him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. It talks about the children that they had. And... You know what? It was completely unknown to Abraham. You with me? Yes. Completely unknown to him. It was unfamiliar to Noah. It was unknown to Abraham. God says, Abraham, I want you to go south, and I want you to stay there. I want you to look around and see what I've given you. And you know what? Abraham says, uh, I've never been there before. I don't know what's there. I've heard there's some bad people there. I don't know what life is like out there. You know what he did? He said, come on, family. We're going anyway. Amen? Amen. Look, do you want to have victory in pleasing God? Okay, it's going to take faith. When God tests you and gives you a trial, right? Because if you're not familiar yet, you'll know life is full of trials. You're either going into one, you're either in the middle of one, or you're coming out of one. That's basically the lot that we have in life, all of us, saved and unsaved. And if you want to have victory over those trials, guess what you're going to need? You're going to need faith. Because when you walk into those trials, sometimes they're unfamiliar, and you're going to have to say, God, I know you're in control. Sometimes they're unknown. God's going to call us into an unknown place or territory or ministry. And you know what? God, you're going to have to say, God, I know that you're in control, so I'm just going to have faith that you're doing this. But look at the next one. Verse number 11. 
Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Did she really judge him faithful who had promised? She laughed at first. <laughs> Don't you know I'm 90 years old? I can't have any kids. Right? And I'm sure the day came when all of a sudden she went, ooh, what's that? Oh, I guess, I guess you are faithful, God, right? God doesn't remember her laughing. God remembers her having faith. Amen. She was 90 years old, and God said, you're going to have a child. She says, I'm past age, man, I'm way past age, right? Sometimes our trials seem impossible. Do you know that? Do you know that God has called me to do some things that I thought were absolutely impossible? Do you know what? I believe God's calling me to do some things right now that are absolutely impossible. And I am being forced to throw up my hands and say, God, this is impossible. But I know this is a trial. And I know that to have victory through this trial, I need to have faith in you. So God, you're in control. Amen. Because in my mind, it's not going to work out. In my mind, it doesn't make sense. In my mind, there's no way that two and two equal five. But with man, <laughs> did you catch that? But with man, listen to me now. With man, that which is what? Impossible. Is possible with God. Right? That which is impossible with man is possible with God. Amen. If you want to have victory when the trials, not if, when the trials come, if you want to have victory with those trials, guess what? Faith is necessary. Amen. Or you'll be consumed and you'll be swallowed up by the trials of life. I want you to notice the next one with me. You still with me this morning? Not only do we see times of trials when it's unfamiliar, when it's unknown, when it's impossible, but how about this? Victory in severe testing. You know God puts us to the test. We've talked about this a lot in our church. But I don't believe as some that God tests us because God is wondering what the result is going to be. Right? Well, God's testing me because He needs to find out if I'm strong enough. No, He knows if you're strong enough. You don't know if you're strong enough. So God puts us to the test for one reason, and that reason is to find, so that you can find out whether you're strong enough or not, whether you're mature enough or not, whether you have enough faith or no. Right? And so God puts us to the test not so He can see, but so that we can see. Because I'll tell you what, there's times when I think I'm really strong in a certain area, Brother Sean. I'll be like, this is my thing. I'm real strong in this area, right? And God will give me a test and I will realize, oh, I got a few weak links in that area I thought I was really strong in. Right? He reveals not to himself, he reveals to us. And so what happens in this severe testing, look at what it says in verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. What is a parallel passage to John 3.16, amen? Shows us that this whole thing is a picture of Christ. Abraham was tested and tried in a very severe way. And you know what? you'll be tested and tried in very severe ways. Amen. And you know what would be nice? What would really be nice is if God tested us and tried us in ways that we understood what He was doing. Oh, the, I, get, oh I get that. God. Okay, that's what you're trying to do. But you know what? God doesn't always do that. God doesn't always do that because He doesn't want to taint the results, first of all. Right? Second of all, God doesn't always do that because he's God and he doesn't have to. And you know what? Sometimes the severe testing 
and trials that he puts us through, guess what happens? We don't understand what God's trying to do. I can tell you there are things that God has called me to do and there are times where God has tried me and tested me and I have no idea why he did that. And you know what? Sometimes we get swallowed up, don't we, with that. We get destroyed. Amen? Amen. In those testing times because, well, I don't know why God is doing this. Boy, if God really loved me, right? Well, if God really cared about me, he wouldn't do this. You're being swallowed up. But you know what will give you the victory? Is if you say, I don't need to understand. I don't need to know why. I just need to have faith that God's in control. Right? And though He slay me, yet I will praise Him. Boy, wouldn't that be nice? And we could have victory when the trials and the testings are not understood by us. Because God will bring you there. God will bring you there. And I've seen many Christians who I thought were strong get broken and not have victory and suffer defeat because they needed to understand what God was doing. And if God wasn't going to reveal it to them, well, then they just weren't going to follow Him anymore. And God says, the only way you're getting victory through this test is faith. And faith doesn't say if. Amen? God, I'll do this if you explain to me what you're doing. God, I will do this because I have faith even if I don't understand to know that you're in control. Amen. Amen. Hey, look, I've been there. I've been to that place where I was inches away from devastating failure. And you know what it was? It was because I wanted to know what God was doing. And I've served Him for... Ten years now, and I deserve to know what he's doing. Right? And God says, that doesn't sound like faith. Amen? Amen. Then I take a couple steps back, and just as I'm about to fall off the edge into defeat, I take a couple steps back and go, Yeah, I guess that's not really faith, is it? Faith is just saying, God, you're in control. And whether I understand it or not, do what you will. But I want you to notice this. Look at verse number 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He says in verse number 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Look at verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. I have a message that I'm working on. It's called Respect the Reward. But you know what? Moses, he was the grandson of Pharaoh. He had anything he wanted at his disposal. The richest nation on the planet in his time was Egypt. He snapped his fingers and he could have a buffet set before him quicker than McDonald's. (laughs) Amen. He called for anything to be done and it was there hundreds, thousands of servants beckoning to his very call. Amen. Amen. And what does the Bible say? He found out one day that he was adopted. He found out one day that he wasn't Egyptian at all. He was Jewish. 
and that his brethren were out there suffering as slaves. And what does it say? It says in verse number 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses was way ahead of his time. You know what? We won't suffer the reproach of Christ because we're afraid somebody won't like us. Moses said, I would rather suffer the reproach of Christ. Think about how does Moses suffer the reproach of Christ? That'll make your head spin. But Moses said, I will suffer the reproach of Christ rather than to live in luxury for the rest of my life. I will give up everything to go suffer for his name. God will often put us to the test. Not because he wants to know what we're made of. He will put us to the test so that we can see what we're made of. Amen? And he will do that when things are not understandable, when we don't get what He's trying to do, when we don't understand what's going on. But you know what? He will do that when things are not comfortable. Sometimes He has to get us out of our comfort zone in order to get us moving. I have birds in my office. They're the funniest things in the whole world. Brother Roy was messing around with them the other day, I heard. Right? These birds are in a cage on my bookshelf. Did you know that the birds, the, the bars on the cage are too wide for those birds? And they can walk out anytime they want to. Don't tell them that. No, they know. They do it sometimes. You know when they do it? When I open the cage door, and I reach in there to move something or to feed them or to put water in there, they get real agitated and scared. I, I guess if I saw a big hand coming into my house, I'd be a little nervous too, right? <laughs> and you know what? You know what they do? They get scared and they slip out of the bars. And then they fly over, they sit on my painting easel or something, and I'll finish cleaning and feeding them. And then, you know what they do? I'll leave the door open for them. About five minutes later, my wife saw this last night. We, I just sat on the couch for five minutes, and all of a sudden they, boop, jump on the cage, and then, boop, jump back in. I said, you know what? They're like little Christians. They're like little legalistic Christians. They love the law. They like to be trapped, you know. They don't like freedom. Freedom scares them. Ah, freedom. We like to be in jail. Right? So they'll jump back in. You know what gets them to move out of their comfort zone? When they're scared. When the unknown creeps in. And then all of a sudden they go, oh, we got to get out of here. I'm not comfortable anymore. Amen. Folks, we are just like those birds in my office. Sometimes when God wants to get us moving, the only way we're going to move is if He makes us uncomfortable or if He gets us scared or if He puts us in a place that's unknown or understandable. And then all of a sudden, we'll start to move. Those disciples got awfully comfortable in Jerusalem. God told them to go. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. What happened? Seven chapters. They're still in Jerusalem. God says, there's the whole world out there to conquer in my name. Right? right? But the Bible says the persecution of Saul. Right? Persecution of Saul. And all of a sudden, those Christians got all uncomfortable and agitated. And that persecution drove them to the uttermost part of the earth. Sometimes God's got to make us uncomfortable to get us motivated. But the only way we're going to have victory in those times is if we have faith. Amen. Here's my last one. And we'll make this quick. Oh, 
unwavering devotion. If you look at the end of chapter number 11, it talks about in verse 31, Rahab the harlot, it talks about David, Samuel. But look at what it says in verse 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens of caves of earth. And these all, having obtained a good rapport through faith, received not the promise. You know, that passage of Scripture right there is prophetic. You know why it's prophetic? Because those things hadn't yet happened. You know what I believe that passage of Scripture is talking about? I think that passage of Scripture is talking about and describing guys like Tyndale and Savannah Roloff and Margaret Pauley and all of those early church leaders who suffered persecution nigh unto death. Do you realize that there were women of the early church who were being burned at the stake and while they were being burned at the stake they had their stomachs cut open in front of them and some of them were with child? You know why? Because they would not recant the name of Christ. I don't know about you, but when I get to the judgment seat of Christ, I want to be able to stand there and say, God, Christ, my devotion never wavered. My commitment to you was never, never tarnished by money was never tarnished by pleasing people. It was never tarnished by anything that this world could offer. My devotion has always been unwavering for you. And you know what that's talked about in that passage of Scripture? All those people who stood with the sword to their throat, with the torch to their feet, staring death right in the face, And you know what they said? I will not waver. I will not step away from Christ. You cannot make me recant the name of my Savior. And you know what the Bible says? How they did that? The Bible says they did that. They got victory in unwavering devotion. They got victory staring death in the face by faith. Amen. By faith. And you say, oh, I don't know if I could ever do that. Listen, God gives you the measure of faith that you need for that moment. Amen. Amen. The Bible talks about in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 3, you don't have to turn there, but it says the measure of faith God gives to us. You may not need to have the faith, faith to stare death in the face today, but you might five years from now. You might ten years from now have somebody knock at your door and say, you have a Bible? Yep. Yep. Well, we're required to take that from you. No, sir. Well, you don't understand. We're going to have to take it from you. No. Well, you don't understand. If we don't take it from you, we'll have to take you away from your family, and we'll put you over here, 
and we'll lock you up for a while until you change your mind and you say, then you'll have to lock me up because my devotion is unwavering. You might need that measure of faith in five years or ten years. But let me tell you, without faith, you'll never have victory when it comes to unwavering devotion. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? Father God, we know that faith gives us the victory. Lord, I know that our world is changing quickly. God, I know that there's no way that we can have victory in our lives without faith. When it comes to pleasing you, when it comes to trials that we are put through, when it comes to testing God, when you're trying us, Lord God, we want to have victory in those areas, and there's only one way to do it, and that's faith. Maybe there's somebody here today who would say, I'm not having victory in those areas. I'm not able to please God because my faith isn't there. I, I, I seem to be really just failing when it comes to trials. And God, I know that you've tried to test me in the past, and, and I just keep failing those tests that you put before me. Lord, I know that faith is the key to having victory. And Like the man who came to you and said, Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. Father, I pray that you would strengthen our faith here this morning.